Welcome everybody to the Paul Bakley School of Prophecy, Understanding the Bible course, and I'm happy to see everybody with us tonight. Pray that all is well with each and every one of you, and uh, we just bless God. We thank God. We thank God. Uh, we praise God for all who are online and those who are coming online. Um, I see a lot of callers in. Uh, Jackie will get your identification later on when she comes in. One comes online. Okay. Um, let's open up with prayer. Let's open up with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We bless you. Praise you. We honor you, Father. You are so wonderful. We love you, Lord, and exalt you and adore you. Father, thank you for this class. Thank you for these beautiful people whom you're raising up uh, to take your word out in these last and evil days. We ask that you bless each one, bless their families. Heal any who are sick. Bring uh, deliverance to any who are bound. We pray that you'll meet every need. Now, Lord, we ask, Holy Spirit, that your anointing will be upon this teaching tonight that we will receive from you. And we love you, Lord. We bless you and praise you. We thank you for what you're doing in this great school. And we thank you for Paul and Heidi Baker. And Lord, take that reverberation off. Thank you, Lord. I ask that you bless Heidi's mother, Lord, and heal her, we pray. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Let the church say amen. Is there anybody who has a question or a prayer need or a request before we get started? If so, then please uh, unmute your phone. Um, Okay. Hi, Pastor Carter. Hi, Zizla. Hi, hi, hi. Yeah, this is Zizla, and I uh, just wanted to give you the update on uh, Israel Gonzalez. Yes. And that uh, the medical board is meeting today to discuss if he's going to be put onto the transplant list. And uh, and so he got his weight down, but today is the day that they're actually going to decide yes or no. And so we're just um, praying that they say yes. Praise and I uh, wish wishing for 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 more more prayer. So we we thank Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God. Thank you, Zisla. Uh -huh. And church, let's pray for Israel Gonzalez and ask God to give him favor. Now, Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for where you brought Israel from. We thank you that you are God, you're the healer, and you know the plans you have for Israel. And so, Lord, we ask that you'll bless and anoint uh, this medical team and give Israel favor that he'll be put on the transplant list. In the meantime, prepare him for a transplant, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you heal people through transplants. We thank you for medical teams and specialists, and we thank you for Azizla and her faith and trust in you. And we pray and bless you in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All thank right. you, Pastor Kai. Thank Praise you. Praise God. Anyone else have any requests, any uh, issues, any challenges you would like to bring uh, to our attention that we can help you with. Well, bless God. Okay, seeing none, then let's uh, turn in our workbooks to page 150, lesson number seven, the minor prophets. We're going to zip through 12 prophets tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Are you going to know about our 12 minor prophets? what their situations were, who they were, what they did. And uh, we're going to do all this in about 55 minutes uh, with the help of the Lord. So praise God. Uh, even before we do that, let's take a look at our assignment for this week. On page 351, your assignment for this week. Write from memory, Micah 6, 8, and journal about what you believe the Lord is saying to you about this verse. Now, some of you did not uh, start in with us on the Communion with God course last semester, so journaling might be new to you. Journaling is you ask God the question, quiet yourself down, and wait for him to answer you. He will answer you. Learn how to quiet your spirit down and your thoughts, quiet your thoughts, 
ask God, Lord, what do you want to say to me about Micah 6, 8? And then write what he gives you. Uh, don't try to figure out what, he's, what you're writing. Just write what he gives you. And then afterwards, you go to the Lord for clarity if you need clarity. Micah 6, 8 says, He has shown thee, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly before thy God. That's Micah 6, 8. That's a, a lifestyle word. That's a word of prophecy from the Lord. And it's a lifestyle word. He's shown us, O oh man, O oh woman, uh, what he requires of us. What does he require of us? But to do justice. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Treat everybody right. Do justice. Love mercy. Be merciful unto all people as the Lord has shown you mercy. And walk humbly before God. Don't walk puffed up or in pride. That is a lifestyle uh, message from the Lord. So number one in your homework assignment is to journal on um, what Micah 6, 8 says. If you have not memorized it, write it out anyhow. Number two, Hosea's marriage was an allegory. This is a new term for you, an allegory. An allegory is a story where uh, the, the characters in the story or events are symbols of a spiritual message God wants to give to you. Uh, an allegory is a message that uh, contains symbols of a spiritual teaching or a spiritual message or spiritual revelation God wants to give to you. For example, Hosea's, Ho Hosea's marriage was an allegory. In other words, Hosea and his wife represented God's relationship with Israel. The relationship Hosea had with his wife represented the relationship God had with Hosea. And when their marriage was on the rocks, it was an allegor it was allegorical, symbolizing that the marriage between Israel and God was on the rocks. Why? Because Hosea's wife went back out on the block, started committing adultery. And uh, spiritually, God was telling Israel, you have committed adultery against me by worshiping Baal and all these idols and causing your children to pass through the fires. And so Hosea is a wonderful book that teaches us many things about the heart of God. Number three in your assignment this week, discuss the meaning of the day of the Lord. Joel talks about the day of the Lord. Um, what does Joel, Joel mean in his prophecy? So read um, our uh, assignment on the book of Joel and you'll get that. Number four, what does God say about festivals, solemn assemblies, offerings, and sacrifices, songs, and harps? In the book of Amos and uh, God really gives us gives us his heart about the church and the things we do in the church and all these festivities and 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 so many festivities and and how he receives these things if they're done in a right spirit he receives them but if they're done just to have church just to do church God is grieved what does this say about the way God feels concerning our so-called worship in the church and in our personal lives. So the book of Amos is a revelation. Uh, number five, in the book of Obadiah, why did God condemn the Edomites? What were the results? So we're going to look at Obadiah and what happened to the Edomites. The Edomites blew it when Israel came out of Egypt. The Edomites had a great opportunity to uh, help Egypt, I mean, to help Israel, but no, they turn their backs on them. Number six, through the episode concerning the gourd, the gourd in Jonah 4, what lessons did God teach Jonah? I wonder how many of our preachers have preached and prophesied. How many of you, how many, even me, have prophesied and God gave you a word to give to somebody and the person repented, so God's wrath did not come upon that person. I wonder how many times we've been like Jonah. You were waiting to see somebody get zapped because of their disobedience to the, to the Lord. But God is merciful. Number seven, Micah was a contemporary of Isaiah. He was an 8th century prophet 
describe the conditions of the people of Israel and Judah in the 8th century BC and why God continued to send prophets to them. Ladies and gentlemen, when you look at the 8th century prophets, Micah, Isaiah, uh, so many of them, and the prophecy God gave to them, and when you look at the conditions in their nation, you'll say, wow, I'm looking at the USA or Sandra Lee up in Canada. I'm looking at Canada. Wow. Or Linda Spada. I'm looking at Canada. What was happening in 8th century Israel and Judah is happening today. And what God did to Israel, what do you think God is going to do to us if we don't repent? And so the scripture, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, you can add that to your answer. If, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and heal their land. That if, it's a supposition. God wants this nation and the nations to repent. Question number eight. We can learn a lot about how to approach God through Habakkuk. We're not finished with Habakkuk. You all thought you were finished with Habakkuk when you finished the last course. No, I, t I told you in the last course, Habakkuk is going to live with you forever because the way he approached God lets us know that we can approach God and we can get answers. God will answer us. But we're going to take a little deeper insight into Habakkuk and look at what were the conditions causing Habakkuk to grieve about his nation. Number nine, who was Haggai? Haggai, okay, just put the A and I together. In the Hebrew, it's called a diphthong, D-I-P-H-T-O-N-G, a diphthong, a diphthong. You put that A and I together and you get I, Haggai. Some say Haggai, but it's actually Haggai, the A and I, or what you call it in the Hebrew, a diphthong. Who was Haggai, and why did God call him to prophetic ministry? He had a work to do. He only, he only ministered for a few months, but he had a great work to do. So you'll find that out when we look at the overview of Haggai tonight. Number 10, describe at least one prophecy of Zechariah. Not Zechariah. Uh, there's no book of Zechariah. It's Zechariah. Zechariah was the father of John the Baptist. But this is Zechariah. What was described at least one prophecy of Zechariah, and how it was fulfilled in the New Testament. One of the one of the major scriptures that we we've learned over the years. One of the major scriptures comes from Zechariah the book of Zechariah. Uh, we, you've heard people say, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. And then number 11 in your homework assignment, meditate on the messages of the prophets. And briefly, underline that word briefly, briefly describe what themes the prophets have in common. From the study of the prophets, what have you learned about God, man, and God's working with mankind and this world? You don't have to take all the prophets. Just take a few of them and uh, identify what they had in common. For example, when you look at uh, Isaiah and when you look at uh, his contemporaries, Micah and uh, Amos, you'll see themes that they have in common. The major prophets and the minor prophets, they had themes in common. By the way, uh, the major prophets are called major because they had more prophecy, more volume than the minor prophets. It's not that they were any better than the others. No, they had more volume. Um, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel are called the major prophets. And included in this is the book of Lamentations because the volume, the amount of what they had to say is much more compared to um, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, and Malachi. So that's your homework. So let's go back to page 150 in our workbook. And we're going to kind of zip through the um, 12 
minor profits. But we're not going to zip zip. Um, if anybody has any questions at this time, we'll stop at this moment and entertain your questions and um, answer your questions. We welcome Marcus Wolverton, Mark Wolverton, uh, on board tonight. Praise God. Tyrone, Fit K Tyrone Kirkpatrick, I haven't forgotten you. Tyrone, you sent me a list of questions to answer. Man, I didn't get to that list today. I'm going to try my best, Tyrone, to get that to that list tomorrow. Okay, by the way, uh, if you have questions, uh, even other than what we're studying, and you want if you want to ask me and, and, and you have time, you can give, even give me a call if you want to, 770-559-9710. Or on my cell 404-205-1101 we'd be glad to share with you the book of Hosea a beautiful book it's a beautiful book Hosea was an 8th century prophet so sometime in the 700s BC he was prophesying and um, I'm, I'm taking the course now on introduction to the prophetic we're going to introduce this to you next semester it is an, um, an amazing course i mean um this course is really uh what i believe every student in in paul in the paul Be begley school of prophecy needs to take as a uh, a preliminary course uh, before you even take pastor paul's course in the fall this course is amazing it is blessing my heart so I just want to share that with you Hosea um, you've heard you may have heard his story over and over again um, God oftentimes gives a person a life encounter a real-life situation with the message God wants that person to preach or prophesy Hosea happened to be the one who drew the short straw in prophetic ministry he, uh, God was looking for someone he could trust to uh, 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 give him, let him experience a bad marriage and a bad, humiliating family situation, and and then God used that situation and turned it into a victory. And Hosea drew the straw. Uh, Hosea was told by God to go and marry a prostitute. She sold her body for money. Many of the men in the community knew her. Now here's this man called by God to be a prophet. And and everybody in town knew he was called by God. And his and so yeah, God told the man to go and marry Gomer. And um uh, Ho Hosea obeyed. And they, their marriage was going smoothly for a couple of years. Uh, uh she gave him three children. And um then after a while she left i mean she went back out in, in in on about back out in the streets and and uh began selling her body and the man of god is left at home uh, with a very humiliating situation he's home with the kids and she's out there running with the other men selling her bodies and god spoke to and and god uh, god allows us to go through humility ladies and gentlemen and um that's why when we, we, we're we teaching how to hear from God, when God speaks to you, hear from God and stay focused and stay prayerful. And, and, and when situations turn adverse, still trust in the Lord. God allows us to go through tests. We see this in Hosea. We see this in Joel. But Hosea did not curse God. He did not get angry. Uh, he, he stayed faithful, even though people were humiliating him, teasing him and this sort of thing. And then in the third chapter of Hosea, God spoke to the man of God and said, now, uh, uh, she's used up. She, she's being sold on the auction block this week. And I want you to go and publicly purchase her. Bid on your wife. Bid on her. Can you imagine the man of God bids on his own wife in a public setting? To, and God said, buy her back. Buy her back, and buy her out of the out of that prostitution, buy her from those pimps, and bring her home, 
and then love her. Don't punish her, love her. Ladies and gentlemen, this is an allegory. It's called an allegory. It's an amazing uh, love story. Uh, this is one of the one of the best love stories you get in the Bible because it's symbolic of God's love for us. Uh, Gomer represents the church. Gomer represents every one of us. Uh, every one of us has prostituted ourselves and committed adultery against God and fornicated and 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 run with the devil and 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 the things of the devil. Every one of us. The Scripture says, "For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God." But look at God. And when God told Hosea, Hosea to go and buy her back, look at. God, because God was showing Hosea what he was going to do with Israel. And then after Hosea obeyed God, then the man of God went out and preached. And the message was, the message was, thus saith the Lord, return to me. I love you. Return. To, can you imagine the man of God pursuing his wife who was an uh, uh, adulteress and, and out on the street selling her body? And he's going out there publicly saying, return to me. Not only saying return to me, but he pays the price to get her back. And he brought her home and uh, and and nurtured her with his love. No baseball bat, no grits and gravy, no acid in the face, no uh, bad mouth, no, no physical or verbal abuse. Ladies and gentlemen, he loved her just the way God said. And then this allegorical story represents how God sent his only begotten son, Jesus, to die on the cross for you and me, for everyone uh, on the earth. It's a love story. It's a love story. A love story. And um, what a mighty, mighty uh, message. By the way, if any of you, uh, hopefully we can, we'll teach. And I, I, pro I probably will be teaching at a later time on our Sunday morning service how to build a hedge of protection around an errant loved one. Loved one. If you've got a loved one who, who ain't doing right, if you suspect that your husband's cheating on you or your wife's cheating on you or your son's and daughters are doing wrong, they're selling drugs or, or, if you, or, or if Satan has any member in your household in bondage or you pastors, you've got members of your congregation who are in bondage. You, you, your chairman of your deacon board ain't doing right. He's gambling. He's stealing church funds. You can get that person delivered with love. Just the, It's the same love that Hosea showed to his wife, Gomer. So at, at, at a future time, I'll be teaching on, on the Sunday morning service how to build a hedge of thorns around your loved ones. Ladies and gentlemen, it works. I'm telling you, I'm telling you firsthand, I'm a witness. The hedge of thorns works. If you've got a loved one's not doing right or you suspect, uh, your husband's not doing right or your wife's not doing right or a child or or anyone under your authority is not doing right you can get them delivered by asking god to build a hedge of thorns and we base this on hosea chapter 2 verse 6. so um we're gonna leave hosea and you read read our uh, read those first three chapters especially of hosea in in the bible and read the description in the workbook and look at God's powerful love as God exhibited his love for Israel and all mankind through the marriage of Hosea. I mean, this is a love story, ladies and gentlemen. And then after Hosea had matriculated, earned his degree in the Paul Begley School of Prophecy, after, after Hosea graduated from the Paul Begley School of Prophecy, now he was ready to go out and prophesy, and the Lord sent this message. Return to me, O Israel. Return to me. I love you. I know you cheated on me. I know you're not doing right, but I forgive you. Return to me. So, ladies and gentlemen, sometimes we've got to go through the school. We've got to go through the school of hard knocks. Uh, 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 we've got to climb some rough mountains. Uh, I know, I know you say, mountain be thou removed. Some mountains <laughs> don't seem like they're going anywhere. But once you've get, gotten that degree and you've you paid your dues and read it in ministry, God can use you 
God can use, and God will use your experiences. And look at what Micah is saying. Uh, do justly, justly, love mercy, walk humbly before God. That's a lifestyle, ladies and gentlemen. So we learn a lot from Hosea. And let's move next to the prophet Joel. Joel. Most people know Joel because uh, Joel prophesied in, in 2, 28 and 29, I think it is, um, 2, uh, 28 and 29. In the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Uh, your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And upon your uh, servants and handmaids, I will pour out my spirit. Joel um, prophesied that all of the church will receive the Holy Spirit. Not just the charismatics, not just the Pentecostals, not just the preachers, not, not, not just the apostles. We all are recipients of the Holy Spirit. That is why we urge you, we ask you, please seek the Lord for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Seek the Lord. Study the scriptures about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I'm teaching on Sunday mornings a series started this past Sunday. I'm teaching a series, ladies and gentlemen, at my 11 o'clock Sunday morning service. It's a 45-minute service, and I'm teaching on a series on why every believer ought to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. In the next several weeks, we're going to talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, how to get the baptism of the Holy Spirit, how do you qualify for the baptism, what is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk about speaking in tongues. We're going to talk about the gifts of the Spirit. We're going to talk about laying hands on the sick. We're going to be talking about casting out demons. We're going to put this whole thing together about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, not what Leroy Carter thinks, but what the scripture says about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We want to find out why the church is running from the baptism of the Holy Spirit. God has already given us a formula to get things done, and he says, do not be drunk with wine in which is excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. I believe in the next several weeks, we're going to look at, at, at about a 10-week a period of time in which we're going to just take a look at the baptism of the Holy Spirit and let everybody know that every believer should be baptized in the Holy Spirit and why. I'll tell you, I'll tell you, once you get the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you realize that the Christian life is like plop, plop, fizz, fizz. Oh, what a relief it is. You don't have to work your way. You don't have to prove yourself. You don't have to kill yourself trying to be a Christian. It's like alka seltzer plop, plop, fizz, fizz. Oh, what a relief it is, ladies and gentlemen. So we just praise God. We just praise God. Yes, Pastor Mark, Marcus, God has more for us. And many believers are living beneath what God wants us to have. Why? Because so many people have their have had their minds messed up by preachers, prophets, pastors, uh, members of the body of Christ who spoke out of ignorance and many still teach out of ignorance about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're taking this baptism thing. I mean, Christ died on the cross and then he said to his followers, he said, tarry in Jerusalem. Wait for the promise. He gave the Holy Ghost as a promise, ladies and gentlemen, so that we can get accomplished what we what he wants us to do. And he spoke this through the prophet Joel, through the prophet Joel, 800 years before um, Christ came on the earth. So we Joel is very, very important. In addition, Joel talks about the day of the Lord. And so in your lesson, uh, you'll look at the day of the Lord. What was going on? What is the day of the Lord? And um, the judgment that's coming. Ladies and gentlemen, God's judgment is coming upon the earth, coming upon the world. Judgment will begin in the house of the Lord. God spoke to me today and said, my judgment must begin in the house of the Lord. God's going to shake up some ministries. He's going to shake up some ministers. He's going he's to shake up some Christians. God wants us to be pure in him. 
walking in the spirit, uh, not walking in the flesh. And so God, God's going to do some shaking. Um, uh, I've been preaching lately on the valley of dry bones, Ezekiel 37. Uh, there's going to be a shake, rattle, or roll among the bones, these dry bones. Uh, uh, some of these things we've been preaching and teaching and living off and giving to people, ladies and gentlemen, it just won't cut it. God wants more for his people. God wants the whole gospel to go forth. God wants the church to rise up. God wants us to stand up and say what thus saith the Lord. God wants us to prophesy. That is why God started the Paul Bagley School of Prophecy. He's raising up prophets. Uh, uh, he's raising up prophets, men, women, boys, and girls. Uh, he's going to raise up an army. It is my daily prayer, ladies and gentlemen. God will raise Raise up an army of prophets. Raise up an army of prophets. And many of you will be in that army of prophets. You're already in the army. And you don't have to wait until you graduate, Tyrone Kirkpatrick. You don't have to wait until you get your degree. You can go out and prophesy now. If God puts on your heart to go and give a word to somebody, give them that word. That's prophesying. Prophecy means you hear from God and then you speak what thus saith the Lord. Tyrone says, I want this power. Tyrone, we're going to talk, man. You got to give me a call, man, so we can talk. God's given me some things for you, okay? And God has given some things for the church. If you're not going to church on Sunday mornings, please join me on Sunday morning at 11 o'clock. And if you are in church, praise God, go there. I do not want to separate anyone from your congregation, but get the video. Get the video. Get the video. We're, we're teaching these things on, they're on our YouTube channel, Leroy Carter. And um, praise God. I'm representing the Paul Bagley School of Prophecy as, as we, as we begin teaching on the baptism of the Holy Ghost and, and um, uh, the, these powerful messages that God has given us. I'm just so glad. I'm just so glad. In fact, the other day I wrote to Pastor Paul, I said, Pastor Paul, I'm placing my whole ministry under your jurisdiction. I'm placing my whole ministry under your authority. I'm under your authority. The ministry's under your authority. And Pastor Paul, I'm available. As you get the people saved at the salvation station, then if you want them to be trained, we can train them in the Paul Bakley School of Prophecy. And I'm available. Jackie's available. So that's what we do. We teach. We teach. We, we want to edify and build up with the body of Christ. So um, the book of Joel, Joel prophesied at a time of great devastation in the entire land of Judah. His prophecy describes the invasion of Judah by a plague of locusts that destroyed everything in its path and impoverished the people. So Joel shows a plague of locusts coming and eating everything. I mean, anything that was alive was eaten by the locusts, animals and plants. Uh, the plague of locusts destroyed the pastures of both the sheep and the cattle and even stripped the bark off the fig trees. In, uh, in just a few hours, what was once a beautiful and prosperous countryside had become a place of great destruction. The plague of locusts that Joel described was greater than anyone had ever seen. All crops were lost, and the seed crops for the next year's planting were destroyed. Famine and drought had seized the entire land, and both people and animals died in great numbers. The situation was so profound and disastrous that the prophet was forced to come to the conclusion that it was the day of the Lord, the judgment of the Lord. So uh, see what God says uh, to Joel and how God has Joel relate that to 8th century Judah and Israel. And then look at what God is saying to us. Ladies and gentlemen, the sins that we're experiencing in this nation and the nation's are so comparable, even greater than the sins of what the prophets encountered in the 8th century B.C. God, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are here by grace. We are here by grace. And unless people repent, unless people repent, 
judgment is coming, ladies and gentlemen. That is why we have the we have the 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 uh, the calling upon our lives. We've got to go and tell them to return to God, return to God, and we've got to do it in love, ladies and gentlemen. You can't beat the people over the head with the Bible. You can't force them, but you tell them in love and you set the example because God wants to save. The scripture says in in first Peter three nine, God is not unrighteous. God does not want anybody to perish but to come to repentance. God wants people to come to repentance. So uh look at Joel, okay? Then let's go to Amos. Amos. Amos is our third minor prophet. Written between 760 and 750 BC, Amos was a layman. He was he was not a, a minister. He was not in the a professional minister. He was a layman. He was a fruit picker, a fruit, a fig tree dresser. He trimmed trees. He cut leaves. He 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 was like he was like somebody with a lawn care service. Okay, he wasn't professional. But he did a professional job <coughs> in trusting in the Lord. He was a shepherd, a fig tree dresser. His home was in Tekoa, which is about 12 miles south of Jerusalem, on the edge of the Judean desert. His name means burden bearer. Amos carried a burden. He had a burden for Israel. He was burdened over the sins of the northern kingdom of Israel. Whereas Amos was crushed with a sense of the unfaithfulness of Israel to the love of God, the prophet was outraged at the violence they had done to the justice and righteousness of God. Not only were the people unfaithful, but they, did, they just turned their backs on God. They lived any old way they wanted to live. And so God uh, called him and gave him a message. It was a time of great prosperity in Israel and Judah. The 8th century BC was a very prosperous time. Under Jeroboam, Israel gained control of the great international trade routes, including the King's Highway that went through Jordan, as well as the Way of the Sea through the Jezreel Valley and along the the coastal plain. Idolatry was widespread. I mean, the people just had all kinds of idols. Ladies and gentlemen, even the priests in the temple worship idols. They had idols on the top of the temple of God. The priests worship idols, ladies and gentlemen. That's how corrupt Israel was in the 8th century. The rich lived in luxury while the poor were oppressed in poverty. Immorality was widespread and the judicial system, the judicial system was corrupt. People interpreted their prosperity as a sign of God's blessings upon their lives. God, however, promoted Amos to tell the people that he was not pleased with them. God's patience was exhausted and punishment was inevitable. Unless there was a change in the hearts of the people, God promised to destroy them. Amos had to go and tell what God had put on his heart. And ladies and gentlemen, when God puts something on your heart, you've got to go and tell it. You can't sugarcoat it. You've got to go and tell it. And so we, we have to ask God, when is your timing? When do you want me to say this? And how do you want me to say this? And you can't be a wimp. Ladies and gentlemen, you've got to have some spiritual backbone. That is why every believer needs to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Ladies and gentlemen, when you operate in the power, the anointing of the Holy Ghost, you don't have to explain anything to anybody. You don't have to make any excuses for anything you say or do. As long as you know you're operating in the power of the Holy Spirit, doing what thus saith the Lord, you don't owe anybody any explanation. So uh, look at Amos. Here's a, a verse, a couple of verses from Amos 5, 21 to 24. God says through Amos, I hate, 
I despise your feast days. I will not smell in your solemn assemblies. Though you offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I will not accept them. Neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beast. Take thou away from me the noise of thy songs, for I will not hear the melody of thy vials, but let judgment run down as waters and righteousness as a mighty stream. God said, I'm sick and tired of your feasts, your celebrations, your, your potluck dinners, your bingo games. Uh, I'm sick and tired of, 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 of uh, your, your fashion shows. And I'm even sick and tired of your, 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 your praise teams and your songs and your choirs and, and your demonstrations. I'm sick and tired of it because you've sinned against me and you won't repent. So I won't even hear your songs. You can sing as much, make all the CDs you want, sell CDs, have concerts, banquets, all this. I won't hear you, God says. Ladies and gentlemen, God is speaking to the church today. So read Amos. The next book is the book of Obadiah. Obadiah. We know very little about Obadiah. It's the shortest book in the Bible. The shortest book in the Bible. Obadiah. Written uh, shortly after 587 B.C. That's the date we use for the fall of Israel. That's the date that marks the fall of Israel, of Jerusalem to Nebuchadnezzar. The central message of Obadiah is the doom of Edom, E-D-O-M, or God's judgment on Edom. You see, while Nebuchadnezzar was running over Israel and Judah and destroying Jerusalem, many of the Jews tried to escape through the nation of Edom. Well, where is Edom now? You don't even, you can't even find it on the map, but it's actually the nation of Jordan. And many of, of God's people wanted to escape through Edom, but the Edomites cut them off. Their army would not al allow the Jews to escape, and many of the Jews were put to death. God did not forget this, ladies and gentlemen. He did not forget this, just like he did not forget that nation that failed to allow Israel to pass through their land when they came out of Egypt. God has a good memory. He will not forget. But praise God, hallelujah, when we repent, he will forget our sins. He says, I will remember them no more. So the book of Obadiah, what God said to Obadiah um, and Obadiah's warning to the Edomites. Um, he told the Edomites, God will not forget how you treated, how you treated his people. So we won't spend much time in this book, although it is the shortest book in the Bible. The shortest book. Obadiah 15 says, For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen, and thou, as thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Listen to this. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen. As thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own, own head. Ladies and gentlemen, all the scriptures tells us to do unto others as we would have them do unto us. What goes around comes around. Uh, as a man soweth, so shall he reap. So Obadiah is reminding the Edomites. God has not forgotten what you did. The Edomites were descendants of Esau, descendants of Esau. Okay, let's look at Jonah. Uh, we're all, all familiar with Jonah and uh, his history, his story. And um, he was a prophet who lived around the same time of Jeroboam II. He lived in the town of gath Hefer, which was a village located five, three miles from Nazareth. He's known as the first foreign missionary. Jonah, the first foreign missionary. God called him. He was a Jew and sent him uh, to go to another nation to preach God's uh, message. 
And that was mind-blowing for the Jews because they thought they had a monopoly on God. But see, God loves all nations. God has no respect of persons. He doesn't love anybody better than he loves anyone else. He wants all the world to be saved. And so we see in Jonah God's concern for every nation. God, uh, Jonah hated the Ninevites, and he reluctantly obeyed God to go there to preach. In fact, God told Jonah to go to Nineveh, and Jonah bought a boat ticket uh, to go in the opposite direction. He was heading for Spain. And you know about the big fish, the big fish. God raised up the big fish. God can, God can make some fish now. He, he, he may raise up the big fish, and Jonah spent three days and three nights, ladies and gentlemen. And this is allegorical. Uh, it's a type of Christ. Whereas Jonah spent three days in the belly of the fish, and uh, it's believed that he died in the belly of the fish, and the and the fish vomited him up uh, three days later on dry land, and God restored him to life. And Jesus used the example of Jonah uh, to remind the people, tell the people he would spend three days in the earth. He would die, and on the third day, he would rise again. So, ladies and gentlemen, when people say, uh, I'm not an Old Testament Christian, I'm just a New Testament Christian, you need to tell them, open up your mouth and tell them, we preach the whole gospel from Genesis to Revelation. We preach the whole gospel. The Old Testament is important to the New Testament. The New Testament is a fulfillment of the Old. Don't separate. Uh, I've heard preachers, I don't preach from the Old Testament. Those are some ignorant, you know, we've got some ignorant preachers. We've got some ignorant pastors. I don't preach the Old Testament. Well, you're just plain ignorant. And I'll tell them, ladies and gentlemen, hey, Matt, I'm not afraid to tell them. You don't preach the Old Testament, you're ignorant. And people are ignorant. They're dumb for sitting up under you. They ought to pack up and leave. In fact, they ought to run uh, from your presence. We preach the whole word of God. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction and instruction that the, the servant of, of the Lord may be thoroughly equipped. God wants to thoroughly equip us with the whole gospel. So Jonah, uh, God sent him out. And he disobeyed God. He tried to go in the opposite direction. Uh, but when God's hand is on you, God's hand is on you. And God wouldn't let him go. Uh, you Now, you know, if you're on a cruise, if you're on a uh, Caribbean cruise, and all the people on the cruise ship come to you, knock on your door, and say, hey, and what have you done? Then you know you're in trouble. You know, if the boat starts rocking and rolling, and the waves and the sea, uh, the sea, Billows are, are, are raging and, and lightning and thunder going on and there's confusion and you're in your room just chilling. You're chilling. You're, you're sitting up in your room smoking some reefer or cracking a 40 or whatever or, 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 or doing an opiate uh, and the people knock on your door. You know you're in trouble. Well, Jonah had that experience. They woke him up from his sleep. Hey, man, what have you done? You're the only one on this ship who's not afraid. What have you done? We know that you have disobeyed your God, and your God is mad at us. He's going to kill us. What have you done? And Jonah confessed, I ran from God. I disobeyed God. And ladies and gentlemen, when you disobey God, not only do you put yourself in jeopardy, you put your family in jeopardy. You put others in jeopardy. And so Jonah uh, told the men, uh, he said, cast me into the water, into the sea. and 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 uh, God will save your lives. And that's how Jonah was thrown into the sea. And when you read Jonah, look at that description of what happened while he was in the, the, the belly of that, of that fish. Uh, 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 a transformation took place. I believe Jonah died in the belly of that whale. And God brought him back to life. And when God, ladies and gentlemen, let's, let's be real. Let's be real about this. Let's be real about this. Hey, Jackie Fisher, if a fish vomits you up on the shore, you'll go and preach, won't you? You'll do what God tells you to do, won't you? She says yes. Hey, Marcus Wolverton, if a fish vomits you up 
on on uh on on the the shore of of uh uh the Wabash. You'll preach, won't you? I'm quite sure you will. I will too. So read about Jonah and Jonah, but then after it was all over, Jonah was angry at God because God saved the Ninevites. And see, ladies and gentlemen, we've got to preach this word and let the Lord do what he says he's going to do. Preach it and get out of the way. Preach it and then, as we say, move over. Let the Holy Ghost take over. Move over. Let the Holy Ghost take over. Sometimes we preach the word and then we try to stay in the way and bring about results ourselves. No, 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 Lord. Like we prayed uh, for Israel tonight, Zizla. Now, we're just going to move over, Ziz, and let the Holy Ghost take over. We're going to move over and let the Holy Spirit take over. And our expectations, Zizla, are high that God's going to bless Israel uh, based on our prayers and his love for him. Okay, so Jonah repented. And we learn a lot about Jonah um, and uh, his relationship with God. Just as Jonah was assigned to the people of Nineveh, so shall the Son of Man be. After three days and three nights, Jonah came out of the belly of the fish. Jesus, after three days and three nights, came out of the tomb. Just as Jonah took the gospel to the Gentiles in his day, so did the apostles take the gospel to the Gentiles after Jesus rose from the dead. Just as God commissioned Jonah to reveal God to the Ninevites, and just as he commissioned Israel to reveal God to the world, so the church was commissioned by Jesus Christ to go into the whole world and preach the gospel. We are under a mandate, ladies and gentlemen. We are to take the gospel into the whole world. Marcus Wolverton says they have some big catfish in in the Wabash. Yeah, well, don't disobey God because I don't want God to have to raise up a catfish big enough to swallow you, Marcus. Hallelujah. Okay. When the church has the attitude of racism and exclusivism that was exhibited by Jonah and Israel, the church fails to accomplish its task. But when the church takes seriously the command of God to arise and go to the nations of the world, those people who hear the word of God and respond to it in faith will experience the mercy and forgiveness of God in a life-changing and culture-changing way. I thank God. I thank God for the opportunity to have gone on several foreign missions and to see people in other nations receive the Lord. Praise God. Uh, Wherever God sends you, he will equip you and he will perform what he promised to do. You go in love. Wherever God sends you, ladies and gentlemen, love the people God sends you to minister to. And now look, look, let's get, let's be real about it. Some of them will get on your last nerve. That's when you give your last nerve to Jesus. Here, Jesus, I give you my last nerve. I'm operating now on your nervous system, Lord Jesus, and help me to operate in love. You've got, we've got a minister in love. Uh, sometimes the very people God sends you to will reject you. They rejected the prophets. They stoned the prophets. They stuffed Isaiah in a tree and saw the tree in half. They killed the prophets. God is sending a message of love to them. God wanted to reconcile them, but they killed the prophets. And ladies and gentlemen, they will not treat you right. Many of you, many of us will have to suffer. Jesus said, if anyone will follow after him, we will suffer persecution. Well, we've only got a few more minutes while the time God, we didn't, haven't even gotten through half of a Micah. Okay, I'll read on Micah and uh, read his prophecy. He's the one who prophesied. And they said unto him, in Bethlehem of Judea, uh, Micah prophesied where the Messiah would be born. Um, praise God. So we thank God. We thank God. And Micah gives us this great scripture, which is our memory verses. 
memory verse. He has shown thee, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? Meaning men and women, what does the Lord require of us but to do justice, love mercy, and to walk humbly before him. And when we do this, we have everything covered. Let's go to Nahum, the book of Nahum, real quickly. Nahum is a mi minor prophet, and his th he's like the, the um, prophet that followed after Jonah. Where Jonah prophesied against Nineveh, so did Nahum. After Jonah preached in Nineveh, there was a great revival, and that revival only lasted about a hundred years. After a hundred years, the people returned to sinning against God. And so God raised up Nahum 100 years after Jonah and, and gave Nahum a prophecy that God was going to destroy uh, Nineveh. And God did exactly what he said he would do. God does not forget, ladies and gentlemen. God does not forget. Nahum 1.15 says, Behold, upon the mountains the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publishes peace. O Judah, keep thy solemn feast, perform thy vows, for the wicked shall no more pass through thee. He's utterly cut off. No more will the wicked uh, come and capture you as they had been doing uh, out of um, Nineveh, raiding Israel and killing people. So that's the book of Nahum. Habakkuk, we studied Habakkuk in our last course, and Habakkuk is so important to the Paul Begley School of Prophecy. Um, this is the prophet who had a real concern about Israel. He was surrounded by sin and idolatry and adultery and corruption and political corruption and corruption in the church. And... Uh, I mean, everything that he saw around him was negative. And, and the, what hurt this man so much was the fact that the Jews refused to repent. And even though uh, deliverance was coming, that judgment was coming, Habakkuk warned the people about the judgment. And yet Habakkuk went before the Lord and he, he went before the Lord. And, uh, and and said, and ask out, God, what is going to happen to these people? I know judgment is coming. I know you're angry with us. But what's going to happen to the people? And that's why when God uh, answered him, Habakkuk said, I will stand on my watchtower. I will stand on the rampart. And I will watch to see what he will say to me when he reproves me. And God answered him and said, and, and said to Habakkuk, uh, um, though the vision tarry, he said, write the vision, write the vision, write what I'm going to give you. Though the vision tarry, wait for it. It will surely come to pass. So Habakkuk's heart, ladies and gentlemen, he was grieved and heavily loaded down because of the sins of the people, even with Nebuchadnezzar on the way to destroy Israel. Habakkuk is pleading with God to save Israel, but yet God says, no, judgment must come because they refuse to repent. And then the, the prophet went deeper into God and said, God, even though these things are going to happen, what are you going to do about your people? Are you going to cut them off forever? Uh, or, or are you going to just wipe them off the face of the earth? And that's when God gave Habakkuk the vision that he would restore a remnant, that Israel would go into captivity, but yet God would deliver them from captivity and God would bring them home. Not only that, ladies and gentlemen, but God told them uh, that he would send one to deliver them. Uh, Habakkuk gets a, 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 a glimpse of the Messiah. And uh, then Habakkuk, at the end of this great book, uh, he says, uh, he, he just praises God and just uh, worships God for what God has shown him. So he had a burden, and God promised him that he would deliver the people. So this man teaches us that we 
can go to God. We can seek God and we can, uh, because we're his children, he wants to talk to us and, and he wants to give us answers and show us the way and we can cast our burdens on him. And so we get uh, this great uh, revelation that the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. God is not going to forsake his people. Zephaniah, we'll take a few more minutes. Zephaniah um, talks about the day of the Lord and the wrath of the loving God. His name means the Lord hides and protects. And he was the great grandson, the great, great grandson of King Hezekiah. Um, we learn more about this prophet than any other prophet in the Bible because of his genealogy. His genealogy, his genealogy, and um, read his genealogy. You'll learn who his father was, his granddaddy, his great great, his great granddaddy, his great 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 granddaddy, and so much about uh, this particular prophet through his genealogy. And so we look at his prophecy, where God um, pronounces wrath upon Israel, but He also pronounces healing healing the day of the lord will come but god will restore his people haggai haggai is we don't have much time with haggai tonight but it's all about rebuilding the temple here's the scenario the jews had come out of babylon in three waves in three waves zerubbabel led the first wave then ezra led a group and um and here they are they have an assignment that first wave that came out with Zerubbabel, God told them, rebuild the temple. Now, this is before the time of Nehemiah. Nehemiah's ministry was all about building the walls around Jerusalem to protect the temple and the people. But that first wave of uh, Jews leaving Babylon were to rebuild the temple. Well, they got came out of Babylon, and they started rebuilding the temple, and they got lazy. Plus, they were oppressed by the neighboring tribes. They were oppressed. They were persecuted. And God's people were just plain scared, and they stopped the work. Fear can paralyze the work of the Lord. And I want to say to each and every one of you, what God has called you to do, you don't have to be paralyzed. You don't have to be paralyzed. We don't have to be like those dry bones in the valley. Uh, prophesy to yourself. Uh, I prophesied to myself this morning coming off the mountain on my walk and I preached to these dry bones in my body. I said, dry bones, you will live. Lord, breathe your breath upon these dry bones. Stand up. And I'm, and, and God has me prophesying uh, uh, to the church uh, uh, that we are to come together. The church, church is time to stand up and do what God has called us to do. For too long, we have been laying there in paralysis and in fear and in doubt and unbelief. And because of our sins, it's time for the church to rise up. And so Haggai had to tell the church the same thing. Uh, the, the people of Israel, this, uh, at, at his time, it's time to rise up. No matter what the opposition is, he had to do what Nehemiah told the people to do when they built the wall. Rise up and build. Rise up and build. And I say to you, uh, students, uh, and my friends, each and every, and I say it to myself, rise up and build. Don't let fear grip you. Don't be afraid of what God has called you to do. Don't be afraid of what's happening in the world. Yes, there's war on the horizon. The war drums are beating. Yes, there are all kinds of things happening, but we are not afraid. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I wonder, can I get a witness from somebody that God has not given us the spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Yes, Marcus Wolverton, the end of the book says we win. We win. So rise up, ladies and gentlemen. Don't wait until you get your degree. Don't wait till you finish all these courses. Rise up now and help shake this world and help bring this world uh, to Jesus Christ. Say what thus saith the Lord and walk in uh, righteousness and holiness and trust the Holy Spirit. God has not given us the spirit of fear, 
but of power and love. Haggai told the people, rise up and build. He reminded the people. He reprimanded them. God sent you here to build the temple and look at you. 16 years, for 16 years, you've been paralyzed. And uh, uh, rise up and build. And so the people rise up, rose up, rised up. They rose up and they built. They built. Zechariah, the Lord remembers. Zechariah, the Lord remembers. He was a post-exilic priest or prophet. Post-exilic means he came after the exiles had returned to Israel. And um, he helped in the uh, restoration of the Jews when they returned from Babylon. Zechariah. His message was, the Lord remembers Zion. The Lord remembers Zion. The Lord said, I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with a great jealousy. So Zechariah was called to encourage the people. He was like, he was like the exhorter. Uh, he helped to edify the, the body, but he also exhorted and reminded them, God is with us. God is on our side. And ladies and gentlemen, after Zechariah and, and Malachi, there are no more prophecies. Okay? Um, Jewish history, Old Testament history, be, ends with the story of Esther. Old Testament story ends with Esther. When you study Nehemiah, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, Old Testament um, history ends with the story of Esther. Esther is all about the Jews who did not leave Babylon, but they chose to remain in Babylon and what happened to them. Ezra and Nehemiah tell you what happened to the captives that returned. That's it for Old Testament history. And all these prophets, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, uh, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, all these prophets work within the framework of the time that uh, God warns Israel about captivity and the time that the captives return. So Zechariah's prophecy is very important, and so is Malachi's. Malachi's, okay? Um, Zechariah gives us this great verse of scripture, Zechariah 4, 6. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. And I want to say to each of you, it's not by might, nor by power, not by how many degrees you have, not, not by how much money you have in, in the bank, not if you're politically correct, lined up with the right political party, not if you know people in City Hall and this and that. It's not even if you're on uh, in, 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 in good uh, standing with your pastor. It's not by might, nor by power, by my spirit, saith the Lord. That is why God wants us to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Let the Holy Spirit live in us. Let the Holy Spirit rise up in us like rivers of living water. Loretta, your church is called, named Rivers of Living. Your church is named Living Water Ministries. And, and let the living water, every one of us who's been born again by the Spirit of God, has living water rising in us. Now, get filled with the Holy Ghost. Get baptized in the Holy Ghost. Let the Holy Ghost come and fill you and rise up in you like rivers of living water. And there is no challenge, no situation you cannot face that God cannot handle. Okay, so Malachi, we end with Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament. And um, he prophesied after the days of Nehemiah when the conditions in Ju Jerusalem were deplorable. His prophecy takes place 80 years after Haggai and Zechariah stirred the people to rebuild the temple. Malachi's message was all about God's claims upon his people. The Lord said, I have loved you. Yet on every hand, the Israelites doubted God and questioned his love for them. When you look at Malachi chapter 1 through 
Malachi 3 8 there are uh, about seven or eight times when Israel doubted God's love for them and and God uh, had to remind them of his love God will never stop loving you ladies and gentlemen he will never stop loving you and me so Malachi was the last of a number of divinely inspired men to prophesy the coming of the Messiah okay so that's about it for our coverage of the minor prophets okay and uh, we pray that you'll read through your workbook and work your way through and if you have any questions please give me a call send me an email I'll be glad to go over with them with you more thoroughly uh, spend time with you um, and help you in any area well, I hope you enjoyed this presentation tonight. I hope it was edifying and, and a blessing to you. And we thank God. We thank God. Um, I just thank God for this opportunity to teach and to share with you and be a blessing. And on behalf of my wife, Jackie, we love you and thank God for you. Praise God. Praise God. We're going to ask the birthday girl to come and give us some closing remarks and maybe open the door for any questions. We're going to uh, stop the taping for those of you who are listening uh, at the video. We love you and uh, thank God for you.